You're watching and listening to Conscious Evolution Media, shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Kids Talk Foundation, a global nonprofit organization providing youth advocacy, television programming, and training services in the United States, along with comprehensive medical and educational services for the developing world people each day. Please help our youth and place your donation. Go to www.kidstalk.org. Are you in the entertainment industry? If you answered yes and you want to promote yourself, your passion, and profession, check out Creative Independent Artist Magazines at CIAartists.com. Endorsed by Kids Talk Foundation Worldwide. Welcome to the Ninon Speaks Internet TV Show. Ninon is an international entrepreneur and philanthropist who's become an influential and positive role model for thousands of people all over the world. Drawing on a rich tapestry of experience from her adventures both in front of and behind the camera, Ninon captivates, entertains, and inspires audiences from all walks of life. Her motto is, nothing happens without you. Now, here's your host, Ninon de Verde Rosa. Welcome to Nino Speaks. Yes, well, that's rather a long name to pronounce out there, Nino de Verde Rosa. My goodness, I've had many a joke with that name. First of all, explaining the Nino, and then the de Verde, and then a de Rosa. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. Today we have uh, Rick Schuler with us. He's an amazing man. He's actually the John Denver of Colorado. And of course, we all remember who John Denver <laughs> was. It's absolutely amazing. And... Um, you are an amazing man. He's done an awful lot. Um, I think you were only, what, 13 years old when John Denver was actually starting to perform and making a big name for himself. And um, uh, why did you, you looked up to him at that age or what happened? Well, uh? <laughs> well that's kind of a story, actually. Uh, uh, I guess at 13 years old, I was told that I looked like John because I had to wear glasses. I, uh, as soon as I put on glasses, I hadn't stopped hearing people tell me that. Yeah. So, uh, and John at the time was becoming popular, and uh, I didn't know actually who he was. And when I saw, when I, when I found out who he was, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the guy on the radio. I love that guy's music. And, um, and his songs really, uh, really struck a, a chord, in, a very deep resonant chord in my heart, and still do every time I sing them. And it's the, yeah, and, and you, quote, we're going to have a song out of you anyway. But you were <laughs> born in, uh, yeah, we are, Louisiana, Missouri, right? Well, actually, yes. I was born in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, it's a very uh, small town in, in Louisiana. And then, of course, I was raised in Missouri most of my life. And uh -huh. I've lived in California for about 18 years or so. So when did you first start um, playing and started singing and started realizing that you were going to kind of fall into the steps of John Denver. It, it, it must have been, you know, it, that's quite an accomplishment. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great honor, actually. Um, uh, well, I guess at the, <clears throat> at the age of 13, I was, people were telling me that it looked like John, and I didn't, uh, as I mentioned, I didn't know who he was. And then uh, I saw a television show called, uh, uh, actually it was a movie called Sunshine, and in that movie, they'd featured several of John's songs, and it was one song that uh, that was on uh, that, that that. In fact, John wasn't even singing it. Uh, a song called "Sunshine on My Shoulders," and I decided to teach myself to play the guitar to that song. And I was discovering that I could sing at that time, and it was also discovered that that uh, our vocal timbre or vocal color was almost spot on. You know, and when people were telling me, in fact, if people tell me that I look like John, I still don't actually. I don't actually believe it. I don't even believe I sound that much like him personally. But when I, when I, uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll take a, uh, I'll see a picture of him, and I think, oh my gosh, <laughs> somebody <laughs> sent me a picture. Look like him. <laughs> well, somebody sent me a picture. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine, Barbara Fisher in Ohio, uh, she underwrote a couple shows that I did there uh, back in November, and she sent me a picture. A couple of them, and people send me pictures of John Denver all the time. And in my audience, uh, in the audiences, several people come up and they've, they're friends of John, or they or they want to give me a picture. Somebody gave me a poster, a life size poster of John, and I mean I didn't know what to do with it, you know. But I, I you know I don't really you know keep those things. But but she had sent me some pictures, and I looked at the picture. I thought, gosh, why did Barbara send me a picture of John Denver? And I looked at it more closely, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have a red shirt. Oh my God, it's me. 
<laughs> and I really freaked out. It was from the stage, and I didn't realize what people they... see. Yeah, it was it was actually scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, that did, really did, did, you, did you try to sing like him and play like him, or did this just all no. come very naturally? No, I actually came by very naturally. Um, I was, um, you know, it was funny. I mean, I, I was basically uh, a very shy kid, and. And uh, when people were telling me that I looked like John Never, all of a sudden I was popular. You know, I had, and I had to wear glasses, which I hated. <laughs> and so, I mean, every kid, hate, every boy at 13 hates to wear glasses because – I think any kid hates to wear glasses, period. Yeah, who I mean, wants you know, to wear glasses, man? You know, thing, you know? Four eyes. Don't hit them in the eyes, man, you know, and all this <laughs> kind of stuff, you know, when you're playing with kids. Now, and, did you wear them because you had to wear them or did you wear I them? I had to wear them. I hated huh? them. My mom, in fact, my mom said, oh, no, my kid's blind, you know, because, I mean, you know, I, when I went, when, when I went, you know, uh, I had to squint, you know, to see the chalkboard, and I couldn't see the doggone thing. And so finally, um, the, 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 the teacher said, hey, you know, you're, you're, you, you need to get your kid's eyes checked. And sure enough, my eyes were so bad, my mom was embarrassed. And um, so uh, but when I had to wear glasses, that's when people were telling me that I looked like John and when I when I was I was just discovering that I could sing and so I went to the public library and I got the Rocky Mountain High album uh -huh. and I was listening to one of the songs in a song called Rocky Mountain High which is my favorite song or well so many of favorites of mine but uh but when I would try to sing to to that album or to that uh to that song I noticed that our vocal uh, it sounded like John to me and it was weird I didn't think that that was I, I really didn't. Uh, I didn't really know what to think of that. Quite frankly, I mean, I had just been told that I looked like him, and now, now I, you sang like him and now now like you played him. like him. Well, you know what I would like to ask now, so our audience can understand a little bit of, of what we are talking about. Can you play something? <laughs> sure. What, 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 what are you going like to play? Well, let's play one of his most popular ones that you like, that, that people will recognize. Oh, sure. Well, I, I think one of the most famous of all songs is one of the great love songs by John called uh, Annie Song. Okay. I love singing this song. You fill up my senses like a night in a forest, like the mountains in springtime, like a walk in the rain, like a storm in the desert. Like a sleepy blue ocean, you fill up my senses, come fill me again. Now everybody knows, now we, we don't have to do a pretending game. Yes, he really does sound, I mean you just sound amazing. <laughs> You, oh, um, and you never, you never actually tried to sing like him, right? Mm. You just, it just came no. out that way. No, actually, I tried for years not to sound like John Denver. Actually, oh. <laughs> I went to my vocal coach when I was about 24, and I just, I just said, "Get him out of me! I don't want to sound like John Denver." And he said, "Well, that's, that's what you sound like, you know." And um, so I, I started uh, in a lot of the rock songs. I did about three or four rock albums of my own, and. Uh, uh -huh. I did everything. I wasn't singing correctly, actually. In fact, I kind of, um, if you don't use your vocal cord, your vocal muscles uh, correctly, then sometimes they agglutinate a little bit. So I actually had to have somebody help me out a little bit. Um, but uh, think for but me to sing. You have to get them activated. Well, yeah. Basically, a lot of times when you when you sing incorrectly, uh, your 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 muscles. There's several little muscles and and cartilage in here and sometimes they get a little stuck together and so um i i had a guy work on me a couple times and man i my voice just i mean it, it never really was injured or anything I, I was very careful um i don't even drink really but uh or do drugs but but it's interesting is that um um for me um singing properly is is singing with tone and with breath support uh and power and when I just sing straight, that's what it sounds like. It's just, uh, it's, and it, it's funny. I mean, I've had people tell me that I talk like him, that my character is like him, that my personality. Hal and Dorothy Thaw, who managed John Denver, tell me that, that a lot of stuff. They really knew John. And um, I, I've, I mean, a lot of my friends in Aspen uh, who knew John and were close friends have become friends of mine. And it's, um, 
I think it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, uh, do, you ever feel, do you ever feel like you're kind of um, living in his shadow or something? Do you ever well, kind of feel? <laughs> it's like walking into somebody else's life, really. Uh, it's different. Um, I must say, for myself, as a writer, as a, as a songwriter, um, I love singing John songs tremendously. I love giving voice to this music. Um, I hadn't really sung them in years, really, very much, until two years ago. Um, <laughs> and then I've been singing them, like, nonstop. Uh, the songs that I write, uh, well, I, I, I love singing John songs even more than my own songs. Honestly. But you are, you are a writer. I mean, I'm trying to find out, you, you are your own person. So you, yes. you, as, much as, <laughs> as much as you are like him and you sing like him and play like him, you, do you really try to sort of be you, be who, oh, be you as a person? Do you put your uh, name out? I mean, your name, are you known as, as your name or look alike John Denver? No, my, my show, the show that is called Rick Schuler uh, and the Rocky Mountain High Experience, the world of John Denver. Actually, Hal Thaw told me that I should use John's name. Uh, jo Hal managed John Denver for his whole life, and he's become a, a dear, dear friend to me. And, and is he your manager now? <laughs> no, I wish I, I wish he would be, but he he he, uh, he actually ma manages John Malkovich, and he manages uh, uh, some some he he does Broadway plays. He's a Broadway producer, but uh, he he doesn't really have the energy to do that for me. Um, but he is helping me. He's working with my buddy from the Hershey Corporation, and uh, and a few other friends to help my career. And he's been a great help, a great help, and a lot of encouragement. Is it hard um, in this day and age with your career and where you're going and, and what you're doing? Because there's a lot of kind of rappers out there, a lot of hard rock music <laughs> I and a, a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I was watching, you know, the the the, uh, the, the game on Sunday, and oh, well, yeah. they came out and they're they're dancing. I mean, they're all over the place. It's like a it's like a a, a show, like a Vegas show when they come out. As, does, it's not as much as the singing, though it is the singing, but it's also this great big show, and you're kind of more of an individual. Yes. You know, it's funny. I, I, I watch that, too, and it, what I think is interesting is a lot of the music, a lot of the music, uh, well, it's different times. I, I think those kind of shows are kind of a blow you, blow you away kind of shows, but they're not really, they're not really, they don't really lend much to contemplative uh, type of situations or uh, the beautiful thing about about folk music and about pop music is that it's kind of soulful, and they're, they're stories really. Um, yeah. They're really engaging, and and really, there's a great hunger I think for this kind of music. Um, the shows that I've been doing have been like magic. I mean, the audiences have just been amazing. Uh, we're doing and a big how show. Far, how far are you in your in your career? Are you are you on top? Because I I, <laughs> I I didn't really hear you that much. I mean, I do hear no. about you because. I, this is the second time I had you on, on my show, and I'm interested in where you're going and what you're doing, and obviously you as a person. And are, are you getting out there? Have you got a? Have, got, have you got your own hit yet? No, I'm working on that. I have, I have, um, I have four of my own albums, but uh, I don't have any hits yet. I'm working on that. I, I have uh, some good shows coming up this summer uh, with the Hershey Corporation. We're doing a big show for them, and. We're hoping to do some shows in China and some lots of big things. Um, working with some other folks as well that uh, have some connections. But it's that uh, I've only been in I've only two years into this. Um, I've been I made my living in the IT industry for most of my life. Oh, you're so. kidding! Now you see. Now you see. I'm thinking because I'm reading your bio here that you did a you did the Jack Carney show. Yeah, I did a lot of that did, stuff. And um, you did a Kids and Co Company show. Yeah. You, on a CBS <laughs> show. You've done a lot out there. I, well, see what people assume. And you know, I'm reading all this, but I didn't. I, I thought you just continued all this. So you've only come back out into it since then. Why did you drop out of it then when you were when you were quite young? Because that's when well. people really pick you up. Well, it's funny is that, uh, and it's been a bit interesting. When I was in college, I was studying computer science, and I really, uh, I, I really loved music, but I really didn't really have any idea what to do with it. I mean, I didn't want to be. People wanted me to do a John Denver show, you know, because I was blowing people away as a kid, um, you know, with the television show, and, and I did, a, I did a radio show with Jack Carney, and and that whole thing was a, a whole story in itself, and several other things, but. Um, but no, I I, uh, I pursued a different career, but I continued to write songs. I've been writing songs my whole life. So you were, you you counted yourself more as a writer than you were as of a singer. 
Well, yeah. I, well, a singer-songwriter, the thing, the thing about the singer-songwriter thing that I love is that the singer-songwriter typically sings his own songs. Of course, other people can too. But uh, I, I love the idea of I mean, Dan Fogelberg and James Taylor and Don McLean and John Denver and, and Carly Simon. These are, these are my heroes, you know, and this is a genre that I, that I love, and, and, and I think it's uh, – uh, I think it's it's a it's a, in a sense it's a lost art form. There's not uh-huh. as many people doing it. You know, a lot of times you have the big show, you know, where you have you know the lights and the glitz. Um, you know, I think it's really cool when you're just by yourself. I mean, of course, I, I have put together bands, but I one of my favorite things to do is to work with an audience, to have an intimacy with with an audience. You know, even when John was big, he would have you know he would excuse the band and just sit out there and, and play some of the love songs with his audience. Absolutely, and that, that can be so beautiful and so romantic. Oh. So we're going to go back. So, so, so at 18, 19, you were back in college, and you started learning computer. You kind of <laughs> yeah. gave up. No, well, you didn't no. give up. You didn't give up because you couldn't give up something you didn't have, but you were, you were quite out there doing very well, but you really wanted to do something else. Well, it's funny. I, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to write, and you know, I didn't want to be a John Denver guy. You know, I just didn't – you know, I, I – uh, I actually, when I got into my 20s, I, I got rid of my glasses, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm not John, you know. I mean, my high school yearbook and in college, people, um, it was, I mean, it, I, it, that's all people, you know, I mean, I had the glasses, and, you know, people just thought I was John. I mean, I, I mean, I had people, I could tell stories about, you know, walking, I remember whenever John came into town, uh, if I was, if I go into a movie theater, you know, uh, people would freak out. People thought <laughs> I was him. And I, and I really didn't, I didn't realize it so much until I looked back and I thought, oh, my gosh. I see some of the younger pictures of myself. I'm like, crap, it really does look like John. <laughs> I mean, and when this, this picture, I mean, I've been doing these shows. And it's funny because the same thing that happened when I was 18, 19 uh, is the same thing that's happening now in my life. You know, oh, with the really? Thing. Yeah, so, so it's you like, kind of had this big gap of being becoming, what, a like, tech man? Were you a, a yeah, tech man? <laughs> I was a tech man. <laughs> Is that what they call them? <laughs> I was. I, I made a joke. In fact, you may have even heard me say this once, is that uh, uh, I used to hang around at parties waiting for people to ask me about CICS, and nobody ever did. <laughs> and CICS was what is my specialty. It's a, it's a transaction processing system that IBM uh, specializes in it ro- runs most of the world on mainframe computer uh, uh, online systems, and so I'm I'm an expert in that. I've been doing that for 25 years. So you're kind of a high tech guy. I, I, I am. Do you, you put like websites together and all that sort of stuff? Or above no, that? that's well, it's it's actually it's actually above and below. It's sort of uh, the stuff that I do is is sort of like uh, I would describe it as Windows for mainframe computers. The mainframe computers are basically the industrial strength. We, we call PCs toy computers, basically. Okay. The, the <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, you'd have like these huge, excuse me, multi-terabyte, um, you know, uh, database managers. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they, these management systems, they, uh, CICS was basically like a control. Um, I, I could start talking geek. I'm not sure if it would make a lot of sense. But, but I, I used to read two million line hexadecimal dumps and code and assembly language and flipping bits and all this kind of stuff with the operating system. And... Uh, for years, I would be doing this stuff, and I think, Lord, am I ever going to do anything with this music you gave me? You know, and, <laughs> but all of a sudden, yeah, because you were given a, a God's talent. I mean, not everybody can do what you do, but and it's so funny because everybody does the opposite to what you did. Everybody yeah. would like to be a singer, would like to go in there, would like to be gifted with all these talents and all this stuff. Forget the computers and all that work, but sitting in a desk and just playing away on you know this computer thing, not really interested in people, but interest in the computer and don't really do that and you did the opposite I did the opposite you know what's funny is that I had my own company and I was making a lot of money and I also got to tour the world I got to do archaeological digs I got to study and learn Hebrew and um, I got to write a lot of songs you know a lot of the travel that I did uh, and the archaeological expeditions that I did uh, really opened my mind to allow me to create so I was always an artist I was just an artist that was working in a technical field. In a different form, a different yes. form of artistry, yes, absolutely. Yes. And also the funny thing is you enjoyed it. Now, absolutely. Now you've turned around again, but also, just a quick question, did you um, write any songs in Hebrew? I have. I've written tons of them. I, in fact, all of Psalm 119 
uh, which is 176 verses in the Psalms, the longest uh -huh. chapter in the Bible. I wrote a melody for each one of those verses, and I have them all memorized. It, well, then you know what my next thing's going to be, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Can you hear some of it? You're going to sing one. Yeah, do you still remember it? Of course you sure, do. Sure, I got them all. Well, well the, the, let's let's have one of your favorites or a popular the one that people because I think it would be amazing to hear that people would never think of you learning Hebrew number one <laughs> number two thinking it and learning yeah. in Hebrew. Well, it's a so, hoot. I mean, even on our, in the archaeological digs, my friends always get a kick out of me because I, I kind of have a gift with I've got like a sort of photographic memory, and the music helps a lot of that. And so uh, in Israel, I'd be, you know, I'd be able to sing and talk in Hebrew a little bit. I, I, in fact, maybe the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew might be more appropriate. Absolutely. Since everybody, uh -huh. I, yeah, I arranged that to fit the melody that's familiar to everybody. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim Yikadash Mecha Tavo Machutecha Yaaser Tsonaka Baaretz Kashanasa Bashemayim Timlanu Hayom Lechemukenu Uslachlanu Edash Mutenu Kasher Salim Nachnu Lashrash Mulenu Al tivienu ide masa, ki im hatilena min hara, ki lecha, hamam lecha, bahagavada, bahatid, leolame, olamim, amin. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my goodness, you give me goosebumps. It's a beautiful language. <laughs> Oh, it is a beautiful, and I have a lot of friends, actually, that live in Israel. In fact, one of my very first girlfriends lives in Israel. I've known for years, and I didn't see her for many, many years. And then we met up in California. It was like we'd never, you know, missed. We were good friends, and she lives out there, and she loves it. And she's got, I think, five children, four girls and one boy, but she loves it there. But the language is beautiful, oh. but also the country is beautiful. I mean, I, I oh. understand it's a beautiful country. It is a beautiful place. I've written so, a bunch of songs in Israel. It's funny, everywhere I went in the world, whether it's Europe or uh, wherever it is, in, in Israel, Jordan, camped out in, in Jordan with a couple archaeologists, uh, which is amazing. But uh, the, these things kind of fill your, your mind and your palate for, for, for creating art. And, um, and I, believe that's, uh, I believe that's super intended, really. But, but I, in fact, Psalm 8510, which is beautiful in Hebrew, Mm -hmm. uh, in English, it says, mercy and love have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. In Hebrew, it says, uh, uh, chesed ve'emet nifgashu, sadek v'shalom nishaku. Nifgashu, they met. Nishaku, uh, kissed. You're right. It is a beautiful language. and It, 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 it kind of flows. You yes. Know? It's, 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 it's beautiful. Is it easy for you to sing in all these different languages? Um, well, I, I think, well... You know, it's funny. Um, I think you sort of, I don't know, I, I wrote a little alphabet song when I was studying Hebrew. And, uh, and it was just, a, it was, it's funny because music, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is an intelligence uh, access point that allows you to sort of branch out into all kinds of different things. So I, to, to, in a word, I'd say that it is kind of musical, that the language is musical. So I found it to be not too difficult, really. I'm looking down here because I, this is all very small and, and um, big. It says Blog TV originates. Oh, Blog TV originates from Israel, and I think we're being featured on Blog TV. Obviously, we probably are. But blog, I didn't know that Blog TV, which is um, something that they take us over, they take our show. You've heard of Blog TV, right? Oh, I have absolutely. Yeah, Blog TV. Shalom <laughs> yeah, yeah, they originate from Israel. I didn't even see. Look, a little bit of knowledge. Yeah. Well, well, no, we're hey. not we're not yet featured, but that was just a uh, well, maybe uh, they feature us now. <laughs> they should hey, if they're hey. from Israel. <laughs> we just we just thank for them. Hello. <laughs> well, I have a lot of friends in Israel. I have about a half a dozen archaeologist friends who are digging up all over the world, are all over Israel. Uh, one of my buddies discovered King Herod's tomb. His name is Yaakov Kalman, and. Another friend of mine um, working at the uh, well. Another friend of mine named Alat Alat Mazar. She's she's working on in the city of David, Ir David, looking for David's temple, and she's found incredible stuff. 
not but uh, the, you know, when you're in sure. Israel, how do you feel? Um, how does it feel to sort of be in Jerusalem and to be in this kind of this old city, oh. this old life? Does it does it give you sort of some some sort of feeling and with your body or something? I'm not uh, saying you're breathing in different air, but it's like breathing in old air. Actually, you know what? I wrote a song called uh, Jerusalem, and the the line in the cor- chorus says. The air I breathe, so heavenly, sweet psalms of joy and peace. In fact, it goes, Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, uh, apple of my eye, song of my heart. The air I breathe, so heavenly, sweet psalms of joy and peace. That's the chorus to one of my songs. And it's interesting is that um, there, is a, there is a special thing about Israel, uh, Jerusalem especially. Jerusalem is like a convergence of all the cultures of the world. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing is, is that... Uh, the, the, the antiquity of, of some of the um, structures, the wall of the old city, um, the streets of some of the old ancient streets that you can walk on that are incredible. I mean, and it, you just you walk on them and you think, oh, my gosh, who else walked on this street? You know? Thousands and thousands of people. Thousands. Yeah. I mean, it's, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Do you get more inspiration um, of, of songs, of, of, of sort of um, writing a song? Do you get more in America or in other countries? Because I'm, I'm, I'm from Europe, and America to me is a very fast-moving country, a very forward country, whereas the other countries, Israel and Italy and France and all these different countries, are much lower key, and they've they sort of got the more of the older texture. Um, mm. Which is better for an inspiration of, of writing songs? Boy, I, does it that's matter? A really, that's an incredibly interesting question. Um, I've never thought about that question before. Um, as I'm thinking through it, um, actually, I think it's interesting. <laughs> I, never I got that. you stuck. That's a good one. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of what I do, uh, a lot of the songs, and, and they, they come, they, they're sort of, I believe that songs are super intended. John Denver used to say, and I love this quote, he said, to be a songwriter is to be an instrument of that which wants to be written. And I believe that is true. Um, and uh, I've written songs all over. My favorite places typically are in nature, uh, along the coast, uh, along the Big Sur coastline. Uh, I've got a little stretch of high freeway there. I love to drive, and I've, read, I've written tons of songs there. I've written songs, uh, I've written songs sitting on a hillside in the south of France, uh, in the evening with the wind blowing and you just get an idea. Sometimes I've written Overlooking songs. Overlooking the Mediterranean, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Or, um, it, you know, I used to, <laughs> a few years ago when, um, when I was in Israel on a dig, I used to, I serenaded the, the, the uh, one of the security, the head of security at the King David Hotel and uh, a gal. And she, uh, she, put, she hooked me up in the best room in the hotel right by where the, the employees used to take a break, and they would sit there and listen to me, because I'd, I'd sing all night, and I would sing love songs to the wall of the old city all night to would try to get this song. Would you sing in French, song. or would you sing in English? I, I tried to write a French song um, uh, years ago, but I, I don't remember it. I think it was called Pour Toujours, or uh, For Every Day. Um, but uh, most, uh, most of the songs, I, are, I mostly sing in English, because most of the songs I write are in English, but, but the Hebrew songs have been... The, the, in fact, these, this Psalm 118, it's, uh, it's basically an alphabet. The, the, it's an acrostic psalm, so there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and eight verses for each letter. And they, the eight verses start with each letter. So the letter A has the eight verses that start with the letter A all the way to the top or the Z. Mm-hmm. And they sing to me now. So I'll be driving along and I'll hear this. Chashavti <laughs> darachai. You start. What is start that? Cutting it off. <laughs> yeah, but like, ooh, you, you know. know. It's fine. You stay driving along. I should know another one, another um, singer, um, quite famous. I won't mention his name, but uh, and he always used to be. Um, he could sort of get songs together and, and get an inspiration driving. Is, is driving Absolutely. influential? A lot of people Shoot. seem to write. I'm not saying they're writing when they're driving, which they probably are, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> I have friends that are writing when they're flying planes. After <laughs> 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 planes. But it, it's the inspiration seems to come along. You know, you're driving and you're sort of happy yeah. or you're alone, and it comes a lot. Why? You know, it's interesting. I used to go to bars sometimes, and I would, uh, I would sit at 
the, the, the more prominent one is that, you know, they're married, they've got a couple of kids and they can't take that yeah. risk. And then, you yeah, know, when you've got, the you've got the, the house to take care of, the car, and you've got all these, all these things that bog you down, whereas you don't have that at the moment, and yet it still, took you, it still took you time. It still, well, and you still haven't found the woman. But I tell you what, you can croon her. You can sing to her. Oh, I do. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny is that, um, I, mean, I, um, I mean, music is, is romantic, and, and I, I, I am a romantic at heart. I've always been, and I... Um, I love I love uh, writing songs for women. I've written a lot of them. Um, in fact, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's just that's my passion, really. Um, but I, I do believe that, that God has a person for me and, and uh, a woman, and I'm looking for her. And uh, I don't know where I'll find her, but uh, well, maybe I pray you should that stop looking, and she'll just pop up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. Up. Well, you're going into a business, and you said you're going to be traveling a lot, and you're going to be doing a lot of things, and and yeah. uh, so you know maybe that that's where it's going. But what what would you like to say as a, as a single man and 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 out there of of the the these men getting married and then divorcing? Um, any feelings about that to to, to try to look, get them to hang in there and to stay? Oh married? yes. <clears throat> well, I have strong feelings about that. I mean, a lot of times people, you know, people think that there's something better for them. You know. And uh, I think, you, you know, I believe in loyalty. You know, you try to work out what, what you have, um, you know, and, and the damage that's done, you know. I mean, to me, the intimacy that you form in communion with marriage is such a deep thing. Um, of course, I don't really know anything about that experientially since I've never been married. But, but I always encourage my married friends to stay together as, as, as much as they can. You know, a lot of times we I, – I like what C.S. Lewis said. He says none of us is very life-skilled. I like that. You know, well, that's true very... too, and and none of us uh, have have a guidance or anything to bring up children. So yes. you know, you, you, you're you're sort of I don't want to say you're winging it, but you're trying to do the right thing. And I just yes. feel that there's so many marriages out there that that now we've got a tremendous amount of single mums, and I'm, yes. I'm not so worried about the single mums. Um, my thing is children, and I look at these yes. four children that really don't know where they're going and I think that a lot of the young people should be careful before they have children or when they get married or whatever you know but on saying that there's an awful lot of fabulous marriages out there that the women and the men have really hung in and in oh, fact, yes. I was just with a I was just with a couple they've got four children and and they're just uh, they just help each other they're involved and she helps him with the business and he helps her with the children and they've sort of made a commitment of helping each other and keeping it together though He's still the man and she's still the woman. And I think that's very important to keep those two um, identities together. I think, you know, women should know that they're the woman and the woman can't do the man's thing and the man can't do the woman's thing. And we both have our roles and I think they're both honorable roles and one's not better than the other. I think it's like a big dance, you know. I, I love salsa dancing. And one of the things that's really interesting with partnership dancing, and I always tell my friends that are married, I say, you know what, you ought to take some dancing lessons. Because the whole idea is that the dance only works when everybody fulfills their role. You in know? sync. <laughs> yeah. So my, in fact, my teacher, Catherine, she used to say to me all the time, and I, and I love this, she says that the man is the frame and the woman is the picture. How beautifully and, put. Isn't that beautiful? That is She's beautiful. A, that's beautiful. There may, there may be a song out of that. No, <laughs> well, actually, talk about a song. How about another song? How sure. What something? would you like to hear? I would like to hear. Actually, I would like to hear something you've written, something you really oh. like that you've written. Sure. Well, I, um, let's see. I'll play. Um, I'll play a little bit of this one. This one's a song called "Whenever You Smile," and uh, and I think what's interesting is is that uh, uh, is that when we leave this world, the okay. one thing that we leave is our smile. And anyway, this is called "Whenever You Smile." It goes like this. You look at me with new eyes, see what no one before could see, I've got butterflies, I can't tell you what I'm thinking inside yet, all I know is that I got a feeling I just can't hide from you, whenever you smile at me, my heart opens windows wide. 
Sweeping away the shadows Welcomes joy inside Maybe it's your eyes that set my soul on fire Maybe I just don't know Whenever you smile at me I'm so inspired Cause I'm so in love with you We're on our way to paradise yet all I want to do is look at you so easy on my eyes been dreaming of you all my life I've been waiting for ya whenever you smile at me my heart opens windows wide sweeping away the shadows Welcomes joy inside. Maybe it's your eyes that set my soul on fire. Maybe I just don't know. Whenever you smile at me, I'm so inspired. Cause I'm so in love with you. Awesome. Do you believe... Whoops. Sorry about that. We got to go, right? Oh, lovely. No, I, 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 absolutely <laughs> awesome. That's amazing. Oh, okay, darling. How long does that take you to, to, to sort of write and think up? Is it an hour, two hours? What is? You know, it's it's different. Sometimes the song comes really fast, and sometimes it takes for weeks, um, sometimes years, really. Uh, that song actually, um, uh, that song actually, I wrote the chorus about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'd forgotten about the song, and I basically rewrote the song um, last year in the spring. Uh, I was at a, a memorial for a kid who died of cancer. Uh, his name is Stephen. He was 26 years old, and uh, uh, the, the, I, I, I had just let, lost my best friend about three weeks prior to that. And so I cried through the whole thing. I, it was a friend of mine that did, did the service. And uh, and I was so taken by this kid's smile and his young bride, and so and I and in fact I was about the the the, the bridge to the song, uh, which I was about to sing. And it's kind of funny because this kind of came back to me, and it says, uh, "No matter how long we have together, I'll always remember you by your sweet smile." And that that, that this whole song just kind of came into me, and I just decided to rewrite the song. Uh, after that event, uh, after that memorial, which was, I think, about March of last year. And, boy, I, I've been in love with that song ever since. It's funny is that how an incident can trigger your mind off, and I guess that's kind of what writing is. Something happens, and it, it triggers something off, and you start getting inspired, and you go oh, from yeah. one to the next to the next, and before you know it, oh, yes. you've got a song going. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a, you always know when it comes because it has a um, it has a uh, it comes from another place, another space. Uh, I believe that uh, I believe that God superintends through our intentions. It's a mystery; nobody understands it. But uh, like John said, you know, a song, a writer is an instrument of that which wants to be written. These songs have their own way about them, and and uh, boy, it's fun. It's fun. It's actually the greatest high to experience in the process of writing a song. That's amazing because that's how you feel. I, I'm not going to say that's how everybody else feels, but they probably do because they're, they're inspiring people that see oh, yeah. things in a, in, a, in a, I'm not going to say in a different way, but in a, in a musical way of putting it all together. I've often wondered how do song lyrics and the tune get together because over the years, all tunes are different. I mean, everything, every tune is different yeah. to, a, to, to lyrics. Oh, yeah. and, and, I, and I've often wondered, how do they get the tune going, you know? How do they get yeah. all that going? The lyrics, you know, you write the lyrics, and, and then the instruments come in, and, and it's amazing to me how it all fits together and how they do it. Now, with you, um, you could just play it with your guitar, right? Yeah, it, but it's funny. A lot of the songs I don't write on the guitar. I write the songs in my head. It's funny, you hear the, them, really, and, and in a sense, um, I think a lot of songwriters describe it, it's almost like you're taking notes, you know, in a sense, I think that it's a very holy thing, you know, I believe that, that God and I write 
the songs together, you know, and I, I feel that I just, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's incredible, it's an incredible experience, Nina. I mean, it really it, it is. It is for you. It's you know, such you, you, a pleasure. You've, you've, you've mentioned God quite a few times, and oh, obviously yeah. you're very in, involved in that arena. Well, I'm a Christian, yeah. <laughs> you are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, it's funny is that you know I I love. Of, um, I mean, I loved the, the, Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote that poem. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways, and and she in that poem she says that I love thee with my childhood faith, and you know my childhood faith since I was a kid I've nurtured it and it's nurtured me, and um, you know and I, I found that uh, space of for writing songs is very centered in that childhood joy. Really, it is well, because when you're a child, you're not inhibited with all these things out there because you just don't know about them. So you're you're very innocent doing something. You're very innocent walking. You're very innocent sleeping. You're very innocent. Your whole life is so innocent until you start sort of you know you start going to school and you start seeing how other children are, and then the influence of other people come into your life. I'm not yes. going to say change you, but they do change you because you they do gravitate to those kids instead of gravitating to those kids yeah. and you, you kind of find where you want to go and um, I think we all find where, where we're comfortable Yeah. wherever I that may so. be now our parents might not agree with it sometimes and I'm sure a lot of them don't agree and then they try to take you I remember when I was married I had six stepchildren and then one particular one, the younger one after school we got into this great school and after school, she would go down to this certain friend, and I and I was a little inquisitive as to because she wasn't my daughter, so it was a little hard. But I was inquisitive as to where she was going, and truly, <laughs> I didn't tell her I never liked it. I didn't tell her that, but I didn't like it. But what I would do, I would start changing life and changing things and going different places and say, "Oh, could you come home after school? I want to take you with me in such and such a place." So I would change things because she did not know the direction she was going in with these people. And yeah. we can change it as as adults, but children don't know. No, they don't. And I think it's interesting is that uh, I don't know. It, it's funny. I, I wrote a little uh, a little poem for a friend of mine named Lexi Potamkin, who wrote a book on what is laughter. And uh, and I wrote a poem for her. And in that process, I, I I've been thinking about this. But there's a sense of childhood joy. There's a convergence of childhood joy and grown up grief. And I think that those are like like a sort of like a dyadic process that through our lives that I think that there's a sense of our creativity that comes out of those two there's there's a there's a there's a negotiation there there, and there I, is and, and I think sometimes I, I always hope that I've had the most beautiful life so I don't really regret um, there may be a couple of things I regretted but not really because I've had such a beautiful life but I often think that some people have had that regret of like like you, you're a prize example. All of a sudden, you were singing, and then you went into the tech side of life, and, and but now you're creating your dream again. So I think what you're saying is it's never too late to really do what you want to do. Absolutely. In fact, I think, I think in, in point of fact, I think that I think I would never have enjoyed it like I do now, because I think, in a lot of times, I think that I think that music is a great uh, conduit to a great many things in the world. I think sometimes if it is your whole world, I think that it can be somewhat limiting, you know, in a sense. You're um, right, because part. that's all you know. Yes, that's all you know. In fact, a lot of times, you know, actors and other people, you know, there's, there's certainly hazards to every occupation. Um, <clears throat> I think in a sense, though, there's a sense of living life. You know, a lot of times the writers talk about you have to live life to, in order to be able to write about it. And oh, so yeah. I think as a writer... Um, I, I love the fact that I had a regular gig, you know, and now I get to do what I've always planned and dreamed. I mean, I've always planned this. It's just I didn't know when. It, I never knew when or if it would happen. You didn't know when to start it. <laughs> I was it always ready. The, it wasn't the time. It just it wasn't, wasn't the, the time. time you know, it, it's, Everybody says timing is the greatest thing, but, but, but what is the time? You, you don't know what the time is of what you do I and how you do it. I think there's a patience in waiting. Um, there's a virtue, certainly, in patience. But I think uh, I feel I feel like I like this ripe piece of fruit that just fell at the right time, you know, and developed. And and as a writer, I just feel I've really I've been writing some of the best stuff I've ever written, 
and um, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, well, that's really because your, your mind is probably free of all those things you've done, and you've, you've been, yes. had a beautiful life. What is your next move now? You've, uh, do you have a manager? Well, actually, Hal has been helping me, um, but I, I don't. Uh, in fact, we just talked about it this yesterday. He he went. He says I need a manager, but at the time, you know, we're doing all this business development stuff. That um, we're, we're, I think that a manager will probably come later this year because we're we're working on. Some when you're ready, things. when you're ready for it, probably. Well, a lot of it is just you know. I mean, I'd I'd love to have a manager right now, actually, if I could. You know, it's just it's tough because. Um, uh, you know, when you're starting out, a lot of times guys want to work with people that already have everything together. We're almost there with uh, with this big Hershey thing that we're doing this summer. It's going to be huge. And uh, some of the other things that I've been working on, um, it's very exciting. I think a manager might – one of the problems, I did work with a manager a few years ago, and it was difficult because he had a certain way that he wanted to take things. And it ha everything had to be streamed through his his vision which mm -hmm. I thought was too which narrow. Was not, which wasn't your vision. Wasn't my vision. So oh. my, you know, so it's interesting. I mean, I, and, and it's hard because a lot, my, my, I do a lot of things. So um, I think that the more you get out there, the more you do, the more you're seen, the more they hear you, and it's just a matter of getting those gigs and getting the next one and then the next one. And that's where, and I can understand where a manager can really help you to get these gigs and know where to put oh, yeah. you. But at the same place, you want to make sure he's putting you in the right place that you want to be. Yeah, I mean, a manager would make my, my job a lot easier for sure, um, you know, and I, I have uh, agents that are booking and, and working on contracts and stuff for me. It's just, you know, having somebody after trying to develop a career, um, right now it's, it's so free-flowing free that um, a lot of my friends that are doing the business development stuff with me, they're like, no, nah, well, you don't really, we don't want you to have a manager right now because we've got too many things that we're working on. Um, you know uh, some some things that re I mean it's and it's really unique. I mean I'm a very in a very unique position, really to have you know I mean the, the, to go to China. Um, we're going to go to China uh, at some point point very are you, soon. Are you, and, are, are you performing in China? Yes, we're planning on performing in China, and it's interesting because John Denver actually is so popular in China. Really. That, uh, Yes. In fact, I met two women from China last year that told me they learned English from the song Country Roads. I met a guy from the Sudan who told me the same thing. And wow. it's so funny is uh, all my life I've met these people, you know, and it's funny. The, the, the people from other countries know John probably better than even Americans, current Americans do, younger Americans do, because, you know, John and his music really, um, I think, really – stereotypifies their ideal of Americans. In, some, in fact, really the best things of our culture, the country roads of West Virginia, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. How can you forget, though? How, how can you forget those songs? How so, can you forget So you're them? going to be carrying this John Denver thing probably around with you, and, and that is kind of, <laughs> that's kind of what's going to happen, right? Yes. Well, you know, it's fun. I, I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy singing John's songs and, of course, my own. I do my own songs and uh -huh. some of the concerts. I do some of Dan Fogelberg's. I do I, – I use John as a lens to take my audience – through Americana, and it, it begins and ends with John because John is the uh, John really is the greatest icon. Uh, he he really he's he really defines the genre of the singer songwriter. Absolutely, he does. And on that, you know, the hour has come up, and it's time <laughs> to short. close this. I know it's too <laughs> short. It's far too short. I I think the audience has learned an awful lot. It's, it's not so bad to sort of um, to go into somebody else's shadow, especially John Denver, because what a what a talent he had, what a man he had. And, uh, I mean, great. he was just an incredible person, and uh, it, it's not so bad going wandering around in his footsteps. Not bad at all. It's it's pretty good. And, and of course, you know, everybody wishes you all the best. Um, what would you like to give it? One very small, fast message to our younger generation out there. One fast uh, verse of a song? No, no, or? just, no, just oh. one, one encouragement. One, one fast encouragement. Thing. Hold mm -hmm. on to your dream. Ah, I love it. Don't I love give it. it up. Okay, well, we've, been, we've had an incredible hour with uh, Rick Schuler. He's an amazing man, and he's uh, the epitome of um, songwriting playing and now he's fulfilling his dream and he's been doing it for a couple of years now so he's really he's on the right road as we say thank you for watching Ninon Speaks and we'll see you next week thank you very thank much you, Rick. Thank, thank you Ninon thank you so take much, care gang. bye 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 bye
Watch the Max Out Money Hour Internet TV show program all about money with your host, Ninon and Coach Steve, every Tuesday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central at realcoachingradio.net. Today's podcast is brought to you by Kids Talk Foundation, a global nonprofit organization providing youth advocacy, television programming, and training services in the United States, along with comprehensive medical and educational services for the developing world. Most recently in Kenya, Africa, where Kids Talk Foundation provides a feeding program, medical care, and educational services to over 1,300 young people each day. Please help our youth and place your donation. Go to www.kidstalk.org. You're watching and listening to Con- Evolution Media, shifting global consciousness at ConsciousEvolutionMedia.com.